we're going to not start in Hebrews today. So uh, if you actually want to turn to Genesis chapter 12, that's where we're going to start today. And I say, as I get deeper and deeper into Hebrews, um, I'm thankful for the opportunity to, to learn it, to teach it. But also, um, I find that each chapter, there, there's no easy chapter in Hebrews. Um, <laughs> it's, I'm waiting for that easy chapter to come along. That's going to be the easy lesson, but it ain't, hasn't shown itself yet. So um, this one, we're actually going to take a little bit. Uh, so if, you're, if you've been following along in the, the book um, or the workbook, we're actually going to take a step outside of that for a minute and do a little bit of background study. Um, the... As we get into the, what chapter 8 talks about, we're going to be talking about a better covenant in chapter 8. And so let's uh, actually do a quick recap of last, last week. We talked about, uh, last week we talked about uh, Melchizedek and uh, that Jesus was after the order of Melchizedek. And we talked about how that um, Melchizedek was, um, well, th there's a common theme here in Hebrews, a, a shadow of a thing to come. Uh, Melchizedek was a shadow of who Christ would be. Um, so we saw that there were similarities between Melchizedek and who Christ was. Uh, we see that you know, as far as you know, Melchizedek, his name himself, Melchizedek, king of Salem, um, of right, king of righteousness and of peace. Well, we know that Christ is our righteousness and he is our peace and he is a king and a priest. Um, we also see that uh, the idea that Melchizedek didn't have an origin story or a, a kind of a, you know, any lineage that he came from, which separates himself from the priest of Levi who had a lineage and had a set amount of time that they could serve. And we also see that he had no successor. Um, he, was, he was Melchizedek. That was it. He was after that order. And so as Christ is, um, had um, no grand, um, had no, first had no Levitical lineage, he also had no grand entrance into the world um, except for some shepherds and some angels and a manger. And uh, so the similar to Melchizedek, he had no real story. Um, that we know the story, but not, there was no grand story of him. Um, we also see that he's eternal. There is no successor to Christ. He is our eternal priest. Um, he is, is constantly making, uh, or is, is our mediary, um, and as our communicator, he's our priest. So, uh, so that was the comparison last week. We looked at also comparing the Levites to Christ, showing that as a, Mal as a order of Melchizedek, that Christ's priesthood is greater than what the Levites were. We see that he was, um, yeah, the, the, the Levites had to do what every time they entered the temple, or enter, entered the tabernacle? What were they required to do? They had to sacrifice, right? They had to sacrifice for themselves to be able to go and sacrifice for the people. Uh, what about Christ? Christ didn't have to make a sacrifice for himself. He only had to make a sacrifice for us. And so we see that he, he's the greater of the Levites. He's the greater priesthood. So we're going to do a little bit of um, uh, kind of background story. Because I, I, not being Jewish um, or not coming from a Jewish heritage and not um, studying the Old Testament you know, is my is this the gospel? Um, it's it's something I think we need. I want to take time and go back to and look at because we're going to be talking about comparing an old covenant to a new covenant. And so for me, I got to understand what the old covenant really says and what it speaks to. So um, I'm going to share a little bit today, and this is uh, we're going to look at the covenants that are given. And I will say this is not an exhaustive understanding of covenants. I'm not a theologian. This is my understanding as I've studied and pulled together. Um, different aspects. So these are the promises that God has given um, to these, several of these patriarchs, uh, from Adam all the way, and we'll see him to cry, the prophetic aspect of Christ and the Messiah. Um, but I want to connect here to see and understand that everything, each one of those covenants points to Christ, or sets the stage for Christ and His, and, and his work. We've talked about last time how that Christ is not the He's not the afterthought in the story. He's, he's the first plant, right? He was, he was the beginning for lamb slain from the foundation of the earth. And as we start to under, see the, um, the, the uh, promises that are given, we start to see how God was laying in place um, the, the fulfillment of the time for Christ to come. And so the first one we see, we're not going to spend a lot of time on, but Adam and Noah. What, what, did, what was Adam promised in Genesis 1? What did God give? He said, I'm going to make man in my image, and I'm going to do what? Give him what? Give him, give him life, but I'm going to give him... Where was he? Where did he make man? In the garden, right? On earth, right? And so what did he give man? He gave him dominion, right? He gave man dominion over all of creation, right? To be a steward. He was supposed to be in charge of it. Take care of it. Um, it's interesting. This separates... We think of uh, evolution and creation. There's this, this passage here separates man from what? 
the rest of creation. Who, what other creature in creation is that God made is, is, is given dominion over creation but man? Yeah, and see, we see, so God is already setting out. He's, before he even starts to set out a people in Israel, he's setting out his creation. And he's setting an order into his creation. And so we see then what happens when we see Noah. God, obviously, man rebelled, um, turned against God, uh, rejected God. And then what did and he, God send flood? And then Noah and his family went on the ark and got off the ark. And what was the promise that God gave Noah? He wouldn't destroy the world again by flood, right? That was his promise. So we see, first we see the stewardship that Adam was given of the earth. Then we see the stage that was set. Where was God's work going to be for salvation on the earth? He's promised never to destroy the earth again. And we see even in Noah that there's a, there's a model there that's given of who Christ was, right? Of repent and believe, repent and believe. Um, so let's look at the first one, Abraham. Because this is where the, and you'll see on your sheet there, um, uh, Israel's covenants really don't start until Abraham, right? Because it's Abraham's lineage is where we get Israel from. Um, so those first two speak to the entire world, right? The, uh, the stewardship, the stage, the, the, you know, not going to destroy the world. But then we see there's some specific promises that are given when we start talking about Abraham. So let's look at the first one, Genesis 12. Oops, I have got my pages backwards. So it says, now the Lord said unto Abraham, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, into a land that I will show thee, and I will make thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse them that curse thee, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. We see here that there's, there's first that direct, um, I will make a na great nation of thee, and I will bless thee, and make thee a great name, and thou shalt be a blessing. That was the first um, part of the covenant that God had given to, know, to Abraham, um, that he, he was going to make them a great nation. Um, who, was, who was the one that was making it, making him a great nation? God was, right? This was, this was not Abraham's doing. This was God's doing. This was God giving, promising to Abraham that he was going to make him a great nation. Let's look at, we'll look at all the, the Abraham ones first. Um, go ahead and turn to Genesis chapter 15. In 15, verse 5, he says, And he brought him forth abroad, and he said, Look now toward heaven, and tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. Um, that phrase we'll come back to later, because it's an important phrase. And he, count, he believed him and counted it to him for righteousness. Um, what did he believe? What was the promise that God gave him? That he was reaffirming, that he said in, verse, in chapter 12. I'll make you a great nation, right? I'm amazed. He, your, your, your seed is going to be as the stars in heaven, as the sands of the sea. Uh, we see that, that record later on as well. Um, and in the name of the Lord, God, or name of the Lord made a covenant. In the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. Uh, we see that he also gave him a place. He, he, so he's, he's defining a people, right, is the first piece. I'm going to give you a people. We're, we're going to, uh, God is, at this point, does God have a people in all the world that's his, that's, that's going to worship him, that's going to be defined by who they worship? No. No, those people don't exist. So God is setting aside, he's saying, Abraham, from here on, I'm going to set you a people. And we're going to, we're going to have a people that's going to worship me. That I'm going to be their God, and you're going to be, and we'll see that in verse chapter 17. But he says, uh, He's, he's, pro he's starting to set aside that promise. Um, and he said, he, and keep in mind, he says, he believed the Lord and counted it for, to him for righteousness. Had Abraham done anything at this point, other than follow God and leaving the country, had Abraham done anything but believe, right? Keep that in mind. He didn't, he didn't do any sacrifices to, to get salvation. What did he do? He believed and, had, and it was counted to him for righteousness. He believed what, the promise that God had given him. Look at Genesis chapter 17. God adds to that, or kind of continues to build on that covenant. And this is after, uh, he says, I will make thee exceedingly fruit, exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come of thee, and I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee and their, and their generations for an everlasting covenant, to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee, and I will give unto thee, and I will, and 
and to thy seed after thee, the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And Abraham said, in, and God said unto Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant, therefore thou and thy seed after thee and, and their generations. Um, he says there, I, to, uh, he says, And thy seed after, after thee and their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee. He says, And I will be their God. Now, it's easy because we, we know God to kind of read that and be like, yeah, okay, that's God's people. But to really think about what God was promising there to Abraham. What was he promising there to Abraham? Especially that second phrase, and I will be their God. This is the God of creation, the God of the universe, is going and saying, I'm going to be your God. That's saying, I'm going to have a relationship with you, a special relationship with you. Um, that's a powerful kind of, that should give you a little bit of awe when you read this. That this is the God of creation, not just the God of the Old Testament, but this is the God of creation of the universe that says, I'm going to have a special relationship with you. I will be your God. Um, and he says, and God said in Abraham, and thou, thou shalt keep my commandment, therefore thou and the seed after thy generations. We see here that the covenant to Abraham, was it a, a two-way covenant or was it a one-way covenant? Did, did Abraham have requirements that he was supposed to keep or did God say, I'm going to keep this for you? Which direction was it? Two-way or one-way? It's a one-way covenant, right? He says, I will make thee, a peop- thee my people, right? There was no question of whether Abraham would become, uh, the people of, of, the descendants of Abraham would become God's people or not. God said, I will make you my people and I will be their God. Um, so we see that there's a, there's a unilateral covenant there. Look at uh, Genesis chapter 22. We see there's a prophetic blessing. We saw this indicated in the first passage we looked at, but he says, and said, by my, and said by myself, have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing and thou hast not withheld. And this is after he's, Abraham has taken Isaac up into the mountain um, and offered him as a sacrifice. Chapter 17 is when God instructs Abraham to circumcise his descendants. And that was the, the symbol that was given. Uh, what was the symbol with Noah, uh, the covenant with Noah? The rainbow, right? There's several symbols we see that God gives to remind them of their covenant. The, uh, the circumcision was the one in chapter 17. In, verse, in chapter 22, this is after um, Isaac was being offered, and he says, I have sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing, which was offering Isaac, and, or willingness to offer Isaac, hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of heaven. Sounds familiar, right? God's re, re, uh, re-emphasizing the, the covenant that he's given. And as the sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gates of his enemies, and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast heard my voice. Now, we see here there's, a, there's an immediate blessing that God's people are going to bless those around them, right? We see that promise given through the Bible. If you know, those that bless you, will, uh, I will bless, and those that curse you, I will curse. But we see, he says, that all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because thou hast obeyed my voice. Because of Abraham's demonstration of obedience. Remember we saw earlier, what did he do when God first gave him the commandment, or gave him the covenant? Did he do anything? It said what? He believed, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now here we see Isaac being offered. God had told him to go offer Isaac. Was, was that an act of, a, act of salvation or an act of obedience? It's an act of obedience. We see it was an evidence of what God had already done in his life. Because he had already accepted Christ and was counted to him for righteousness. So we see, but we see here, he says that all thy nations, uh, because of thou, thou hast obeyed my voice, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. We see at the same time, this is not just speaking to the blessing of Israel as a, as a nation. It's blessing of what is to come. Who is to come out of the nation of Israel? Who is to come out of the nation of Israel? What's the Hebrews about? What person that's really important, that's better than anything else? Christ, the high priest, Christ was going to come out of the nation of Israel, and he was going to bless all nations, right? All right, so let's look, let's move on. So we get the idea of where Abraham was. Abraham's promise was about a people, that he was going to set them aside, that he was going to have a relation, start to have a relationship with them, um, that he was going to bless them, uh, give them a place to live, make a nation of them, which they did not have at the time. So let's look at Moses. 
So Moses, uh, in verse uh, 19, we see, And Moses went up unto God, and the Lord called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob and the children of Israel, You have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bear you on eagles' wings, and brought you unto myself. Now therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar pe treasure unto me above all people. For all the earth is mine, and ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation." Right. Do you notice something different in this covenant? What does God get, say there at the beginning? In verse, in verse 5. Now therefore, if what? You obey my voice. Indeed, and keep my covenant. Then ye will be a peculiar treasure unto me above all the people. A kingdom of priests and a holy nation. All right. So we see there he says that uh, there, there's a condition, right? He starts out with the condition. He doesn't start out with the promise. The condition is what? If you obey my voice and keep my covenant then you'll be a peculiar treasure unto me above all the people. God was offering here to be, um, to set them apart even more. It wasn't just a nation, but you're going to be a special nation. You're going to be my nation. You're going to be God's nation. Um, and what's even more important with that last, in verse six, it seems like a short passage or short, short verse. And we just kind of read over, okay, kingdom of priests. Yeah, they had the Levites and a holy nation. But God was establishing the expectation that he had for the Israelites. What was, what was the role of a priest? In, in simple terms, he had two roles. Who did he communicate with? He communicated with God, and he communicated to the people, right? So the priest's role was to represent the people to God, right? He was to offer sacrifices to, to God for the people and say, here's, you know, he was helping to be the mediator and atoning for the people. What was he supposed to do for God or for the people? Communicate what God had spoken to them, right? He was their representative of God to the people. Could the people go into the holiest of holies? No. So he was the only one that could communicate with God and come back out and speak to the people. So when he says there, a kingdom of priests and a holy nation, what's he expecting of the Israelites to the world around them? He's expecting that they communicate with him. That's the, pecu that's the peculiar treasure. There's a, they're going to have a communication with God. But what's he expecting of the Israelites? Was he expecting them to be to go out into the desert, kind of put some walls up, and just talk to God all day long? No. What's he expect of them? To be, a, to be the message of God, right? To be the, be the light into the world. They were going to be the, 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 uh, the, to communicate what God had said to the people around them, right? So be a, a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. So that required them. If they're, you're going to be communicating with God, what's that going to require? You're going to enter into the Holy of Holies as a people. What's it going to require? Sacrifice. It's going to require some standards, right? There's going to be some things that God's going to expect. You couldn't just go into the Holy Holies. There was a, pro there was a process that God had established to go and communicate with them. Now, he's not saying that everybody, you know, non-Levites were going to go into the Holy of Holies, but the idea being that if, I'm going to, if you're going to be my representative, there's some expectations, right? You're, you're going to have to meet some standards to represent me. Um, so we see, he says there, let's go on. He, he, in Exodus chapter 24, God sets those standards. And the Lord said unto Moses, Come unto me into the mount, and be here, and I will give thee tablets of stone, and a law, and, a commandments, which, and commandments which I have written, that thou mayest teach them. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, They, they bring me an offering of every man, that may, that get, every man that giveth it willingly with his heart, ye shall make, or ye shall take my offering. And so God says, okay, first I'm going to give you some, some commandments. I'm going to give you the things that I'm going to expect of my people. If you're going to be my people, I'm going to have some expectations. If you're going to represent me in the public, I'm going to have some expectations for you. We do that at work, right? Where your, your employer has some expectations. If you're going to be at work in the front desk, you need to dress a certain way. You need to um, approach customers a certain way. That's what God's saying here. If you're going to be my representative, you're going to be required to live a certain way. I'm going to give you some things that's going to define how you live that's going to be different than the world. The world's not going to understand it because why? Because they're doing whatever's right in their own eyes. But God's going to set some standards that they didn't understand at the time. Um, why do you think they had some, well, just use pick on one. Why do you think they had some of the dietary standards that God gave that seemed kind of abstract at the time? Why do you think God gave some of those? For health, right? He knew some of the dangers of science that people didn't understand at the time. So God gave them some directions about eating unclean things um, and saying, be careful when they handled certain things. Um, 
So, but God wanted the people to be different. He wanted them to stand out. We think of um, yeah, the, the Ten Commandments that he wrote upon the stones. As those were a guidance that gave them, uh, they couldn't just do whatever they wanted to do. They couldn't be like the people around them. They had to be different. Um, but see, that, so that's the first step. And then the second piece we see in, there in chapter 25, he starts to establish his tabernacle. And that's really what we're going to look at in Hebrews is about that tabernacle. Um, so keep that in mind. He says, and bring, that, they, that they bring me an offering of every man that giveth what? Willingly with his heart you shall take my offering. What was the offering for the tabernacle? What did God require? Did he go and say, okay, everybody's got to give me a third of their gold and their silver and their bronze and their wood? What did he say? That giveth it what? Willingly, Right? So here's God establishing his law, what he required people to do. But what was he more concerned with? Their heart, their willingness of their heart. So even when we see the Old Testament law, there's an establishment of where the importance of the, 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 the heart towards uh, the willingness to serve God. Let's look at exa- uh, Exodus chapter 29. A couple, page, a couple chapters over. And we see he's, he's, he's so we, he, here he's gone in, a stout, in, ch- in chapter 25, he starts to give the instructions around the tabernacle, what they're supposed to bring together. Um, and in, verse, in chapter 29, he says, And there I will meet with the children of Israel in the tabernacle and be sanctified by my glory. And I will sanctify the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar. And I will sanctify also Aaron and his sons to minister to me in the priest's office. And I will dwell among the children of Israel and, be, and will be their God. And they shall know that I am the Lord their God that brought them forth out of land of Egypt, that, they may, that I may dwell among them. I am the Lord their God. I'm not going to give a full tabernacle study. We give, I've, I've had pastors and teachers give tabernacle studies for weeks. And we could go into the tabernacle and talk about how each piece um, represents uh, what it means and, and, and spiritual means and what it means to the people. Um, but catch this where he says there. So first he sets aside Aaron and his sons to minister as the priest office. So that's, that's the Levitical covenant, right? He says, Aaron and his sons are going to serve me. So he sets them aside. He says, and I will dwell among the people of Israel and I will be their God. What's different in that phrase than what he promised Abraham? He promised Abraham, I will be their God, right? I will be, you'll be my people and I will be your God. What's he say that's different in verse 45? I will dwell among the children of Israel. It's interesting, as I was studying this, and, you know, I, I understood the tabernacle as a spiritual place, as, a, as almost the church for the nation of Israel. That's where they went to worship. That's where they offered sacrifices. But as I start to study it more, and it was just one, and maybe it was just me, but it, I started to understand that the tabernacle wasn't just a spiritual place. It was the key, court of the king. Where does, where does God come down to and sit? In the Holy of Holies. And we'll see it, we'll understand this, because in Hebrews, this is an important thing to understand. God comes down and sits on the Holy of Holies after, the, after what? What did the priest do on the mercy seat? Spread the blood, right? So they spread the blood and then God could come down because the people had been atoned and he could sit and commune with, with, the, uh, with the people, with, with the priest. His presence was there. He says, I will dwell among the children of Israel and I will be their God. Uh, the idea that it wasn't just God, that they weren't just serving a God as the people around them serve gods, right? The, the, you know, Baal and others, they served gods and their gods were far off. You know, they never saw their gods. Their gods were never next to them. Here we saw, what does he promise? I'm going to be with you. Yeah, this is, this is not Emmanuel. This is not God walking with us, but he was dwelling with us. He was, this is, you know, the idea of dwelling is the idea of house. Like this was God's house. God was going to spend time here with them. He was going to, he was going to sit down and, and, and rule from there. Um, and it was a temporary place. We know that because God has promised, we'll see the Messiah, in the Messiah's covenant, or new covenant that's coming, that's going to be, or in, in David's covenant, that there's going to be a permanent kingdom. But we see that Israel had, it wasn't just that they had a, a God, you know, that was among other gods. They had a God that dwelt with them, that, had a, that wanted a personal relationship with them, that wanted to be with them and experience it with them. Um, he didn't just give commands from afar off. You know, Moses didn't have to keep going up to the mountain to get commands and bring it down. It was, it was a God that wanted to be wherever they were and wanted to show them that he was going to be wherever they were. And it says that I may dwell among them. I am the Lord their God. So we see that this, covenant, that this, this, this old covenant dealt with the tabernacle, dealt with the priests. Um, it dealt with the presence of God and where God was. Let's look at um, 
some of that covenant. Now, this covenant, again, we talked about God had given them a promise. I will dwell with you if you do what? What did they have to do? Obey his voice and keep his commandments, which included what? The sacrifices, which included the commandments. They had to follow him. If they wanted him to be in their presence, what did they have to do? They had to obey. They had to serve. They had to do what what God had called them. Therefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath. This is in chapter 35. The children of Israel keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and, and on the seventh day he rested and he refreshed. And he gave unto Moses when he had made an end of communing with him upon Mount Sinai two tables of testimony, tables of stone written with the finger of God. God this is where God has given him the law, and he set aside the Sabbath as the sign. Remember we saw that what was the sign with Noah? The rainbow, right? Abraham had the circumcision. What did Moses have? The Sabbath. The people stopping to rest to show who their God was, that their God was not just the God, not just another God, but this was the God who created everything. Um, yeah, and they were modeling that creation. Uh, and he, so he gave them stones upon it. So we get an idea of what that old covenant was. Was that old covenant, and we'll talk about this some more as we get into Hebrews, was that old covenant enough was that old covenant focused on salvation? Was that old covenant a means for salvation? No. What was the old covenant for? It was setting how they were supposed to represent themselves to the people around them. Right? We see that. You're a holy nation, a holy priesthood. It was going to teach them about salvation, but it wasn't going to bring them salvation. Um, could anybody ever keep all of the law? No. So why would God create a practice that says you can't ever keep this? God wasn't using that for salvation. He was using it to teach them of what was to come. Um, And that's what we'll look at in Hebrews. Um, Let's look at David. And David's a little bit different um, as far as the the old covenant goes. What I want to share, because it it sets up who Christ is. And it's important when we we talk about in Hebrews about Christ being the better. Um, And Christ also being of the lineage of, or being of the order of Melchizedek and not of the, the, the Levites. In 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12 and 13, it says, uh, And when the days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build an house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. What was the promise to David here? Yeah. Yeah, he's actually giving a, uh, he's, it's a prophetic promise, right? He's giving not just, he, he's promising David a lineage, right? A kingship lineage. Like, you're going to be king. You're going to be, no, you know, your lineage is going to bring forth a king. Um, and that, some of that was immediate, right? We saw that with Solomon and his, his you know, and, and as far as the immediate kingship. But we also saw, see that in the long term, right? When Christ is going to come. And what's he say there at the end? He shall build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Who's the house that he's talking about? The house of the Lord. He's talking about when Christ comes, he's going to establish. Um, he's, what, is, what did Christ tell Peter? Upon this rock, I build my church, right? So he's talking about the church. He's talking about what he's, you know, that, that, um, that new covenant that's going to come. And then he also says, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Has that happened yet? The throne of his kingdom? No, he's giving, so he's giving that, that he's, he's prophesying when Christ will come. And then he's prophesying the second coming of Christ in that, in that covenant. So look at uh, Psalms 89, and this is David writing of the same, same promise. It says, I will sing of the mercy of the Lord forever with my mouth while I make known thy faithfulness to all generations. Uh, that's hard not to sing that line. Um, sorry for, those, for that song. Um, for I have said, mercy shall be built up forever. Thy faithfulness shalt thou establish in the very heavens. I have made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn unto David my servant. Thy seed will I establish forever and build up thy throne to all generations. Selah. It says there, I have made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn unto David my servant. What direction is that covenant? Is it a two-way direction or a one-way direction? One way, right? This is God swearing to David. I'm going to set up... um, I'm going to establish you forever and build, upon, build up thy throne to all generations. Um, it's interesting. What's he start with at the beginning of that, uh, that passage? He says, I will sing on the mercies of the Lord forever. David understood his position, right? That he was just a man. That he was receiving a covenant of God. 
Uh, the, just like Abraham we talked about earlier. It's easy to say, well, Abraham just got a people, right? Abraham was going to have a lot of kids. Like, that's what God gave him. No, God was building that, was, was, was reaching out and, and, to, and uh, investing himself in the lives of, of these people, of these men. Um, and David understood the gravity of that. He says, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever with my mouth while I make known thy faithfulness to all generations. David had seen the previous covenants, right? David had seen the faithfulness that God had had through Abraham and through Moses um, and, and into his day. And we see that, um, that, that, that David knew that that faithfulness would continue um, in the covenant that God had given him. Thy seed will I establish forever and build up a throne to all generations. All right, so we see, and with and with David, we also see that there's, uh, we didn't look at all the passages around David. What's, what's the other prophecy around David and the root of Jesse? There's a shoot that's going to spring forth out of the root, out of, Je, out of, the root of Jesse, right? And that's the prophecy that's given. And who's that about? Who's he referring to? But Christ, right? So the idea here is that we've got the kingship of Christ being established in David, uh, that lineage of the kingship. Um, that as you know, he was going to be a king of that Christ was going to be a king of Israel. Um, we also remember that's back thinking back to the the uh, story, lesson of Melchizedek and who Melchizedek was. Melchizedek was both priest and king. Um, so we see that David establishes that that lineage, uh, and what'll come up again in a minute when we look at the uh, the prophesied new covenant. Go ahead and turn to Isaiah. We're going to look at the new covenant, and when it refers to Christ or to the Messiah. It says, Thus saith the Lord God, uh, He that created the heavens and stretched them out, He that spreadeth forth the earth and that which cometh out of it, He that giveth breath unto the people upon it, and spirit to them that walketh therein, I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness, and I will hold my hand, uh, hold thine hand, sorry, and will keep thee, and keep thee for a covenant of the people, for a light of the Gentiles, to, uh, to open the blind eyes, to bring out the prisoners from the prison, and them that sit in darkness out of the prison house. Here we see a prophetic message of, what, of, the, of where the new cov- of, of the new covenant. It says, I will, he that created, he talks about who he is. I, I say, I saith God the Lord, I the Lord have called thee in righteousness, and I will hold thy hand and keep thee and give thee for a covenant of the people for a light of the Gentiles. This is interesting. Who's, who, you know, who's, who's the one that would get this prophecy? The Gentiles or the Israelites? As far as, like, who was, who was Isaiah writing to? The Israelites, right? It's interesting. The new covenant, what's he promising already in the new covenant? That they would pass on to the Gentiles. That the new covenant wouldn't be just about Israel, right? But it would be a light unto the Gentiles. It would be, um, we talked earlier, a, a, a nation of priests, right? A holy nation, a, a kingdom of, na- of, of priests, a holy nation. What was the role of the priest? To be a light to the world around. So here we see the new covenant isn't, isn't something unheard of, but he's giving a more, he's, he's kind of bringing it to reality for the Israelites. Look, your new covenant is not just going to be about you and you know, the blessings you're going to receive. You're going to be a light to the world. You're going to be a light to those outside. And we saw that with um, the order of Melchizedek. Was Melchizedek a, Israel, a, 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 a Jewish priest? Was Melchizedek a Jewish priest? No, because the people hadn't been established. Remember, Melchizedek predated Abraham. He blessed Abraham. Um, so Melchizedek it was a priest for the people, right? He was a priest for all. So we see that he was a priest of the Most High God. And we see here the same, that the, the New Covenant is going to be a light for the Gentiles. Um, and I tell you, as I was studying this, I keep, as I mentioned before, as I started getting into this more and more, I got excited to see that God had already planned, back when Israel didn't even realize it, God had already planned to be a light to us, to, to us Gentiles, um, to be a light to the world. That this wasn't ever, this was never a promise between just God and the Israelites. This was a promise to the world, and that they were going to be a light to the world. Look at, um, let's look at Jeremiah in the New Covenant. It says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant in the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with the fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was a husband unto them, saith the Lord. Remember we talked earlier, what was the covenant with Moses? Was it a one-way or two-way covenant? Moses was a two-way covenant, right? If you, keep, if you obey my voice and keep my covenant, then I, will be, then I will dwell with you, right? What happened when the people continued to rebel? And God gave them many chances to come back. 
What happened when the people continued to rebel? What happened to Israel? What? Judgment, right? They went to exile. God, took, God destroyed the temple. Have they ever had God dwelling in the temple since? No. It's interesting. God says here, and then he talks about it here. He says, which my covenant they break, although I was a husband unto them. God was faithful unto them. But what happened to the nation of Israel? They, break, they broke his covenant. Um, they did not represent him to the people around. They were not faithful to him as he was faithful, uh, as he was faithful to them. Um, we see that there, there's a new covenant. He says it's not going to be according to that covenant that he made with their fathers. So what do we know about the new covenant? Is it going to be a conditional covenant or permanent covenant? It's a permanent covenant, right? He says the, condition, the, the covenant I made with my fathers was what? It was a conditional one. He says they break it. I entrusted to them. There was, they, they couldn't keep it, right? There was almost no way that they could keep it over the long run. Um, it was, it was, it was, it was uh, we'll look at the word later. It's a faulty, um, it was fault in the old covenant. But it wasn't the covenant, it was the people that were keeping it. Um, and let's look at Jeremiah 31. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel in those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. When we read that passage, uh, that should get us excited as believers. When we think about what the new covenant means to us today. Read that again. Read that, especially in the middle part. I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Thinking back to Moses, what was the significance of the, the covenant with Moses? What was God going to do with the people? He was going to dwell with them, right? Well, how did he dwell with them? In the tabernacle, right? He, had a, he came to the tabernacle. Could everybody experience God's presence? No. What's he say there? I will write my law in their inward parts and in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. And you go down, and he says, in, in verse 34 sounds interesting. We read it and we say, well, shouldn't we be teaching people to know God? Because he says there, and they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, know the Lord. But what he's saying there is there's no need for us to tell other people about God that can never know him. Right? It's a, they had to describe who God was. And they had to teach each other that. But he says, well, guess what? For they shall all know me from the least of them unto the greatest of them. The idea that salvation isn't just for the greatest of us, right? It's not just for the most intellect, the ones that know God the best. What's he say there? It should the least of them unto the greatest of them. He says, and the Lord say, for I will sh shall forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. What was the fault of the old covenant? What did they have to do continually? Continually, continually offer sacrifices. But this new covenant, what's he already promising? Your sin's going to be gone forever. Can you imagine as Israel seeing this, for the, as, as, as Jeremiah preached this? Yeah, God's talking about removing sin forever. Like, that's, that's would, yeah, they, they hadn't seen that. They had seen this continual offering of sacrifices, and now God's promising to remove sin forever, to dwell with them, to, you know, there's no table anymore. There's no, uh, you know, no law on the table, tablets anymore. He's going to put that in our hearts. We're going to know what God wants us to do. He's going to dwell and communicate with us. The individual, the greatest and the least, the least tribe is going to know God, like the Levites did. Like, that's what he's giving the example here. The Levites are the ones that got to see God, got to experience God as close as anybody else could. But the least tribe is going to know him just as much as the Levites would. That's what he's talking about here. Like, this should be, an, as, as an Israelite, I would be excited to know that this is who God is. But knowing that he said what? This, this new covenant is going to be extended to the Gentiles. This should make us even more excited. This was someone that was, we couldn't even get near the tabernacle, if you want to think of it that way. We weren't even welcome in the camp. We were the Gentiles. We, we didn't even have any, anything similar to the Israelites. But God says, you know what? The least of us will know him. And he will forgive our iniquity and remember our sin no more. Look at Ezekiel real quick. Ezekiel 36. He says, Then I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean from all your filthiness and from all your idols, and I will cleanse you. And a new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you, and cause you to walk in my statutes, and ye shall keep my judgments and do them. And ye shall, and ye shall dwell in the land that I give your fathers, and ye shall be my people, and I will be your God. The new covenant does what? 
It echoes of what God, it's, it doesn't just echo, it's, it's, it's the fulfillment of what God had given Abraham, what God had given Moses. Because he says there at the end, and I will be your God. But how is he going to do that? He says, I will put in you uh, a new heart. I will give you also a new spirit within you. Um, that new heart is not just going to be a, a, a heart of stone. What's, what's the reference there? What was the law written on? Stone, right? The idea of the, the, we're not just going to give you a, a you know, here's the law that you need to understand. He says, I'm going to give you a living law. I'm going to give you a law that you, that you can understand and, and, and uh, understand from your inward parts. You know, it's not just going to be something that you put up on a wall and say, these are the Ten Commandments. But it's going to be something you're going to understand inwardly because I'm going to be with you. And I'm going to give you my spirit. And what's, what are we talking about there? The Holy Spirit's going to be within you and cause you to walk in my statutes that you may keep my judgments and do them. What was the fault of the old covenant? What could the people never do? Obey it all, right? But what's God promising that he's going to give us? The Holy Spirit to help us obey all, right? This is better than the old covenant. The old covenant, they had, there was an expectation they were going to have to give, continually give sacrifices. But what God say? Or what's the new covenant say? That he's going to give us a new heart and a new spirit so that we can obey him. Um, he says, then I will be your God. He's renewing what, God had, what, what Abraham and Moses had been given, that he will be our God. Um, Let's look at Ezekiel chapter 27. This ties back in the covenant with David. It says, And David, my servant, shall be your king over them, and they shall have one shepherd, and they shall also walk in my judgments and, and observe my statutes and do them. Okay, so for a hold on for a second here. So we're in Ezekiel, okay? And he says there what? And David, my servant, shall be king over them. What, where was David at this point? He was dead and gone, right? Long time ago, a while ago. Um, he says, and David, my servant, shall be king over them. Was he talking about David? No, he was talking about the lineage, that he, the covenant that he given with David. David's covenant, David's lineage was going to be king over them. Um, and that they shall walk in them and, dwell and, observe my, and walk in my judgments and observe my statutes and do them. And they shall dwell in the land that I shall give unto my servant Jacob, or give, given unto Jacob my servant, wherein your fathers have dwelt, and they shall dwell therein, and even they and their children and their children's children forever. And my servant David shall be their prince forever. So we see here that this is not just, yeah, we're, we're seeing here that there's, a, there's an indication of, who, of Christ coming um, and, and, and having reign. But we're also seeing there's a, the further kingdom, right? He's establishing his kingdom as Christ, but he's also seeing what? My David, servant David shall be prince forever. There's an eternal kingdom. There's a prophetic message here as well in the new covenant. And look at verse 26, as we continue on. Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them. It shall be an everlasting covenant with them, and I shall place in them and I shall place them and multiply them, and will set my sanctuary in the midst of them forever. My tabernacle also will be with them. Yea, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And the heathen shall know that I, the Lord, do sanctify Israel, and my sanctuary shall be in the midst of them forever. Uh, so we, we see here, he says, my sanctuary shall be in the midst of them forever. He repeats that twice. My sanctuary shall be in the midst of them forever. What is the sanctuary? When it comes to the Israelites in the tabernacle, what's the sanctuary? It's the temple. It's the tabernacle. It's the place where God came to dwell. So it's, it's the, it's the uh, place they came for, for, um, for salvation. It says, my tabernacle shall be with them. Um, I will be their God and they shall be my people. This is, again, God uh, reaffirming in the new covenant. God's going to establish, continue that relationship that he had established with Moses. Um, he says that, know that I, the, the heathen will, shall know that I do sanctify, uh, the, that I, the Lord, do sanctify Israel. That there's going to be an understanding that who it is that brings salvation. You know, it's not going to be the people earning salvation back, right? Or earning um, God's presence back with them. Because they'd already broken that. That was far gone. What was, what was this? This is speaking to a, an idea of grace. That God's grace, God's, through his grace, is going to bring the tabernacle to us. Where's the tabernacle in the new covenant? This is, this is going to be a trick question. Where is the tabernacle with us? Where? I see some pointing. In us, right? God is established. He says, you're my temple, right? So where, when, when you go anywhere you go, can you, where's the tabernacle? Anywhere you are, right? And he says there, my, my, ta my sanctuary will be in the midst of them forever. Since he didn't spell it out. He didn't say, you know, you're ta you know, I'm building my tabernacle inside of you. What's he say? He says, I'll be in the midst of them forever. 
um, the idea that wherever we go, we have the tabernacle with us, um, that God is dwelling in us. Um, that's different than what the old covenant provided. Um, so let's do a quick summary. We covered a lot of passages. And I said, we're not going to have to split this one up. But because um, I want to give this background, because I want you to understand as we go into Hebrews 8 and really get into the old covenant and the new covenant, I want you to understand that old, the true tabernacle, as he talks about, I want you to understand what he's really referring to there. And so you, hopefully you've got a little bit of, and hopefully I didn't, uh, I didn't uh, butcher it too much, but uh, giving you a little bit of, of uh, Old Testament context for when we, we get into this new covenant. But we see Abraham's covenant established a new people, right? God didn't have a people that, he had, that, that, were, that were his. Um, he didn't go pick a people, if you notice that. God didn't go say, God could have said, okay, um, Anak, you're the tallest, you know, you, you got the giants of the land, I'm going to pick you, because I know you can take on anybody. Who did he pick? Abraham. He picked a guy to go start his people, right? He knew he had to start from scratch. He had to start with a person that would serve him. Um, God's promise was, was unil both unilateral and prophetic. He was promising both to, to make Abraham uh, and his descendants of people, but also um, the blessings that those people would give in the future. Um, that was establishing that line of Israel. The covenant reaffirmed, was reaffirmed by God to Abraham again and again. I will, uh, I will make you a people and you will be, I will be your God. Um, that promise to bless other nations. It's interesting that that's woven in at the very beginning, the very old first covenant um, that he gives to Abraham. He's weaving that in to say, you are going to bless other nations. Um, Abraham didn't, understood that to be probably in a more tangible realm. Like those that were nice to us, we're going to be good to them. But that was a much, it was much more, it was much bigger than that, uh, what, what, they, what Abraham could ever imagine. Uh, we see that Moses' covenant establishes God's relationship. Um, he, God goes from being a distant deity, someone that they offer sacrifices to, but never, uh, only can come to him in visions and in, 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 uh, in, 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 in dreams. And here we see that he's going to be a, a, a present ruler. He, God's coming down to, to guide the nation of Israel. What kind of government was the nation of Israel? What kind of government were they at the beginning when Moses established his covenant? The a theocracy, right? What's that mean? They were ruled by God, right? They didn't have a king. Who was the king of Israel? God. So that's where the tabernacle represented the king's throne room. That was the opportunity for them to commune with their king. Um, that the idea that this was not just a deity that was far off, but he was, he was their king, he was their present ruler. That fellowship was conditional. It required them to be holy. It required them to continue and, and keep those promises. Uh, the law could not save, but it set a pattern for salvation. It, it, set a, it exposed their need for salvation, exposed their need to trust and put their faith in the Most High God. Um, the people failed to represent God to the world. We saw that when they went to exile and that God took away his presence from them. Um, he continued to, pro to, to prophesy to bring them back but he removed the presence from them and established the new covenant. Then we see David's covenant established. Um, they established the Messiah's royalty. It established that Christ was not just going to become as the new priest and not just to establish the religious order of Israel, but to actually establish the kingdom of Israel, um, the, the king, establish God's kingdom on earth. It prepared the way for the eternal king and it speaks to Israel's future kingdom. Um, we see that the new covenant is defined by redemption, by mercy, um, the indwelling of the law and, and, and guidance that he was going to he's going to be within us. Right. He's not just going to give us a law that we have to follow and understand. He's going to teach us the law. He's going to indwell us and teach us that law, uh, restoring fellowship with the leaders and the leadership of God, that God was, was going to establish his tabernacle in us and among us, not just um, not just with a people, but with all of us. Um, that entire humanity would be blessed. Not, the light it would be a light to the Gentiles. Um, and that we would personally know God and walk with him. Like that's what the new covenant establishes. So when we get, next, get back next week, uh, we'll look at Hebrews chapter 8 um, and look at how Christ provides a better covenant. We'll look at what that covenant is, the new covenant and how it's defined by Christ and his, his priesthood. Um, I encourage you to read chapter 8. We're going to, we're going to finish chapter 8 next week, and then 9 is tied very closely in with chapter 8, and so we'll finish that one the week after. Any questions? Hopefully it's a little inspirational when you start reading the old... I mean, I'm, if I have a preference of where I read in the Bible, obviously New Testament 
fits, you know, um, under, understanding my walk of life, um, you know, my Christian walk in the New Testament. But when I, but reading the Old Testament to understand where those covenants mean and that God's plan is, is, is perfect, um, that he had, he, had, I, he, had, he had seen salvation from the beginning of time and he had seen those promises upheld again and again. All right, let's close in a word.